How is everybody doing today? Um, thanks for being here. Today we're going to talk about some blues rhythm guitar stuff and how to spice up your blues uh, on a basic boogie woogie shuffle just like that. So first things first, Phil is not here today as our lovely mediator, mediator, moderator. So uh, my friend Hermano Bonifazi, who's been uh, here for a long time, is online helping out today. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. There was a, the tropical storm and it knocked out all of Phil's power. I have a tree down in front of my place here too, but no, no damage here. Because in Brooklyn, the power lines are underground in New York City. So out in the suburbs, not so. So I think it knocked out a lot of power in Phil's area. So he will not be here. So first, I have instead of, um, uh, you can download the background track, which uh, what I've done today is there's a link and it, it's in the, the description and it's also in the chat of the, p uh, the background track, I put it in my YouTube channel so you guys can check it out. And it helps me with people watching and getting the likes and all those sort of things like that. That makes a big deal that more people. Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. It's not related to Corona. It is related to allergies. So I'm just going to pop a, <laughs> oh, a, uh, <laughs> a throat thing here because it's driving me crazy. Anyway, all right. So, um... All my courses, 25% off. And the jam track that I'm using is from one of my courses, one of my older courses. When you go there, you see me with like hair and darker hair. And it is my blues guitar survival guide, the rhythm edition. And what we're going to do is look at some really cool basic variations on a boogie woogie blues that really helped me a lot. And uh, if you go the course through my website, it's 25% off. You enter the, the uh, code uh, LIVE25. <coughs> Excuse me, and please like and subscribe and all that and share all the stuff. Okay, so the first thing I'm basing this off of is we, everybody's learned that, right? Your basic boogie woogie blues, right? I assume we all know that. So I'm not going to go too deep into that right now because we want to start looking at some of those variations. So the first one is, well, what do we do on the five chord, right? So we have our B7 chord and we can do, right? And that's cool, but that's a bit of a stretch sometimes, you know? If you're standing up, that kind of stinks, right? So I'm going to show you two things. First thing we could do is just play the B7 chord, which I actually like that a lot, because what that does is it breaks up the <coughs> the boogie woogie pattern. Sorry, guys. The B7 chord, uh, if I just play it instead, so I'm coming from my E. Right? So it was probably the first difficult chord we learned on the guitar, right? Remember if we're learning that first B7 chord, you're like, oh man. And the, the hard part about that chord, honestly, guys, is because you're using your third and your fourth finger together, and that just makes it a little more difficult to play. That's kind of a, just a simple sort of hand thing. All right, so um, here is a cool thing you can do instead. I didn't do it in the intro because I forgot, but I'll show you this. It's the same as doing, but you're not jumping over the guitar next to do it. Right? So here I'm going to do this. A little weird. I'm going to play my B with my second finger, get my B, my F sharp with my pinky. So I'm still getting that root five thing. And then if you look, you would get a root that was a six. So we'd have B and we'd have G sharp. Then we stretch that A. So I'm going to play the G sharp here. So I have a B and my G sharp, and I'm muting my fourth string. And I'm going to play the B and the A. So watch, I just got to make sure I mute that fourth. And this is really helpful because you can, well, it's easier than going. That does sound different if you're doing, right? This kind of thing. That's a bit of a pain. This is kind of, doesn't sound the same, so you gotta be careful, you know, depending on what sounds you want. But this. Right? Okay, so 
What's nice about that is it's also transposable to anywhere on the neck. So if I wanted to play a blues in C sharp, I can just take that same shape. Pretty cool. Or F sharp. Now it does have it like it's a different quality. But man, if you want to play that, that is really a pain to do. Right? Come out like that, but. That kind of thing like that. So we're having a little bit of an audio lag, you guys are saying. A tiny lag between Jeff and the audio, though. Ugh, welcome to the internet, guys. I can try to fix it live, but that can be, uh, it was fine <laughs> the other day, and now it's not, maybe. Who knows? Um, if it's really terrible, let me know. Okay, and refresh the section. Okay, refresh, and it'll go away. Okay, good. Cool. All right, so, this move. Saved my butt in many situations because your hand gets tired, and you're leaning over the guitar, you know, you're standing up. Right? That stinks, but... Okay, there's my first thing. So we want to check that five chord to B7. All right, now the other thing that's a lot of fun is we can break up the boogie-woogie patterns. Your initial thing is... We've done that a million times, right? So if we break it up, we can get this sort of Jimmy Reed thing where I'm going back and forth. Right, this move. That's pretty cool because what that does, it adds a variation. So we can do... Watch, I'm not going to do the variation. Back to initial. So those little variations make a really big difference to a listener, and certainly to me as the guitar player. Um, so that's one. Now this other thing we can start throwing in in the bottom. So now we have our basic one, all right? This is our basic. And then we can actually stretch out to put this flat seven here. So we have root five, root six, and then root flat seven. So right? Now before the change, a sounds really nice. I'm going to play a G and G sharp to my root E. Same thing, watch. Right, so this is a cool move. Now I can bend to this flat seven. That's another cool thing.
like that sound because it just adds another element, right? If you listen to Clapton's version of Ramblin' on My Mind that he does on, did on the Blues Breakers record, he does that quite a bit. That kind of thing. It's really nice because you can get the vibrato in those notes. Right? So these are all just variations on the same thing, and they're all pretty much interchangeable. One of the things you don't want to do is change them up too much, right? You want to establish what the blues is. So if it's a... We could add in... Same overall feel. Right? So being able to keep that together, I know sometimes that, you know, this isn't the most sexy stuff to learn on the guitar, you know, uh, people always want to talk about soloing and, you know, the diminished scale and all these sorts of things like that, which of course are extremely important, but being able to do this really solidly and make it interesting is one of the most difficult things I've had to learn how to do because there was a sort of degree of, um, hubris on my part where I'm like, eh, it's just a blues. How hard could it be to play rhythm guitar on that, right? And I found out, uh, you know, many times the hard way on gigs that it is actually quite difficult to get this together and it requires a lot of practice and a lot of patience. And one of my favorite expressions in many things is if you're bored doing this, then you're not doing it right, right? Because you can never be bored doing this. I mean, okay, look, if you're playing a whole night of just a shuffle like this, yeah, that gets boring no matter what you do because uh, it's a lot of the same. But if you're playing a tune, you do a few of them, you should have enough variations to keep it really interesting. Okay, so the next variation is the motion of moving this interval to sixth. So if you look at our bass line, it goes to that kind of Jimmy Reed thing. Right? Where I'm breaking up the, the eighth notes. Three and four and one and two and three and four. So the idea I'm gonna do this, my low E, I have my B and my G sharp. Some hybrid picking. So here I have E, B, and G sharp. That C sharp, I'm gonna move this first finger up to the A, then move up to the B and the D, and back down. That's a really cool sound because it, it's our next level of variation, but it's not intrusive. So then we go to the A. So what I did here is A, my bass with my pick, and then my, my pick is going to alternate between the fifth string and the fourth string. And then I'm going to get this C sharp. There's that F sharp, and now I have the D, G, and E. So we have put that G on top because it sounds cool. That's in Zeppelin, right? That's a common move. You can even just as chords. with this. So I don't have to go. That's cool. 
Now I could do it on my five chord. That can sound cool. If you do that too much, I think it gets a little predictable and not as, as interesting sounding. So let's hear that. I'll shut up and I'll play those chord versions, which I think are really useful. Okay, so I'm just going to do the chord stuff. Vibrato that chord. Slide. Here it is in the A. It's okay. Swing it, right? So you see how that really works great. I need a vibrato of that too. Now as you notice, or you may notice, I'm doing a lot of muting on the left hand. So I don't go. Right, that's not what we want. So my fingers just flop over. So everything is muted except the fifth string and the third string, and I actually loot the loot. I mute my low string. See my thumb is getting that. And I can mute here too. So that's, I love that stuff, man. That is really cool. And especially if you have another guitar player and they're doing, and you're like, well, what am I going to play? Sometimes that. Watch. So I can start to, as I said at the beginning, I can start to take some of these variations and work with them. And we have the general theme of, right? Add in that. My friend's right now. Right? Now I'm gonna have a little more variations. Right? 
So I can start to really mix those in and <coughs> have some fun with it. Now, you're also super important is the dynamics. Did you, did you, hopefully you noticed I wasn't just banging through. Right? So we've got a lot of. Right? Right? So I'm getting that downbeat. So getting this one and two, three and four, and one and two and three. One and so hit that downbeat on the one. Right? Live. Right, you can really just So the dynamics are huge. So whatever level you're at, like I know I just played a lot of, a lot of shit there and, and moving around and trying different chords. I was just trying to be overly dynamic when they're like. <laughs> and that's really important to be able to do that stuff when you're playing with the band and people can follow and adds a lot of excitement. Um, so, uh, but if you're just, say you're not at the level of doing some of this stuff yet and you're like, well, how do I work on this? Well, just watch. Right, you know, just overdo that downbeat, like really punch the crap out of it, and also try to play as soft as you possibly can. And it really brings people in. where the buzz of my guitar is louder than what I'm playing, <laughs> which is when you live in New York City, or probably any city, uh, some days the buzz changes, you know, due to the power grid, and I'm, I'm sure there's some power grid problems going on because of that big storm, and that's why Phil isn't here, but thank you, Hermano, for everything you were doing right now. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so, the, uh, oh, uh, Graham Ross, there's a sliding sixth lesson. Okay. Um, this will be another lockdown at some point, or whatever I'm calling this right now. Um, I have a course at Truefire called Solo Electric Blues is Essentials, and where I tell you 10 blues like this, just solo blues that you can play by yourself. I highly recommend the course. Uh, it's what I do every time I pick up the guitar. So what I'm doing right now for you guys is something I pretty much do every day. I sit down, play a blues by myself, because what it does is it helps my time it helps my feel, and it's self-contained, right? Especially now that nobody's really out kind of jam with anybody else for the most part, <coughs> at least in the States. Um, you can, you know, sit up here. Right? And you can have a lot of fun doing this stuff. Right? Thank you. 
Now this turn that I'm doing, you guys may know, or you may not, it's like an E7 chord, right? I'm gonna slide it up to the 4th fret, back down to the 3rd fret, 2nd fret, 1st fret, meaning your 1st finger. And it's the beginning of... Yeah, I'm not playing that. Hold on. A very poor version of I'm so glad. Um, but that's that, that move. So you can work that in. All right, so this is just the frame. This is just the beginning. This is the... This is where you want to start with this stuff. And then you can start to move up the neck as I did a little later on the song, you know. You can start with this E7 chord like that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I made a mistake, which I do all the time. But what happened there, especially in these live things, is I was like, well, how am I going to get out of that? So that's one of the fun things about doing this blues by yourself. If you screw up, figure out how you can make it work. And the more you practice this stuff, the more you kind of feel like you're on top of uh, it's a... It feels like you're performing, at least in your own house. And that allows you to make those mistakes and figure out where it wants to go and how you can get out of the the corner you may have painted yourself into. Um, so, like I said, a lot of this is just, it's, it's, a, it's what I do a lot at home. Um, pretty much every day, I'll sit down and do this, because it's fun. And I'm always thinking about tunes, like I said, Ramble in My Mind by Clapton off the Blues Breakers record, which is a real big, a big record for me. Um, a lot of Clapton stuff was, but that in particular, that, that tune is great. I mean, like Life on the Drop, Stevie Vaughan, that's a great tune. Um, same kind of ideas as this. Um, I mean, any of these tunes. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> just any of these songs playing by yourself. All right, so um, got a bunch of people here. And thanks to everybody who is here right now. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, thank you, Romano, for doing everything. And everybody, you know, like we've got, uh, I appreciate... The tip jar, it helps me continue to do this, uh, helps me uh, afford to do this, because, um, you know, people are like, oh, the YouTube revenue. You don't make any money on YouTube until you're way up there. So this is the way I, I help uh, support my income. Um, if you guys like this, I get the True Fire courses uh, through my website uh, as a link here. You get 65% off of everything. And, uh, sorry, not 60%, 25% off of everything. And just so you know, as I said before, when you guys pick up courses through any of our, the True Fire Artists sites, we actually make a little more money. Well, actually a lot more money. So we appreciate that too. All right. So any questions? Um, uh, higher voice, this is messy, but higher voicing was from the first lockdown. Yeah, you know, I've shown a few of these things in other ones. But as you can tell, like all these things start to become a bigger picture as part of your standard vocabulary. Right, so if I'm going to do this kind of thing. Right. So I mean like all these variations, it's standard stuff that you know how you need to know how to play. And what is also really nice is um, what's really nice is to not have to think about all of this um, on the fly, right? You've practiced a lot of these ideas. So you build up that vocabulary.
right? So you're just building that up so you know what to play at all at all times because you practiced it. Now I'm gonna take a quick look at something really here in my camera. Cause we're saying they're having some crashing issues. I just want to see if I can see this. No, oh, I should be right. Okay. All right. I thought maybe I was streaming at a higher rate than I should be, but I am not. Okay, we're good. Um, so I don't know what's up. You know, I think some of the issues maybe people might be having is because of uh, maybe the where I'm broadcasting from and all that kind of stuff. There was a hurricane and there's probably a lot of outages, so I was assuming that some of these things are starting to happen. Okay. All right, Hermano, it's good. Just a thought, a quick thought I had now that I've learned so much from you about doing this. Okay. Um... All right, so as we're going through this, you want to start thinking about building that vocabulary. So one person I learned a lot of this from was playing with Robin. Um, man, like I had my ass handed to me, as you can all imagine, a lot uh, in the best way possible. And I would get the dirty look, you know what I mean? I'd get the look like, what are you on stage? You know, what are you doing? Like, and then you're like suddenly... The cold sweat starts coming along. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, he doesn't, he doesn't like what I'm doing. And if you get that stink eye from him, it was, um, it was a real kick in the butt, right? And that's great. I loved it because I didn't take it as I was, as, I mean, I, you know, I was there because he wanted me to be there. Because um, he liked the way, as he said to me one night, yeah, you know, because I wasn't stepping up one night. I was pretty timid at the beginning of a tour because, you know, nervous playing with Robin Ford and uh, Toss Panos and Jimmy Haslip, you know, these heroes of mine, guys I love and love and love, love. And I was really, you know, nervous. And he just kind of said to me, he's like, hey man, you're not here because you're my friend. You're here because you, you can play. So play. And that was some of the stuff I, I would listen to the way he would approach dynamics and I've learned so much from just hanging around with him, how he can control he can control the whole audience and the whole band by his dynamics if they're paying attention. And if they're not paying attention, they're not gonna be in the band. But the idea of how how big he could take something and how whisper low he could take it, and how it brought everybody in together and it just made everything so much better. The audience, the band, creating these moments that only dynamics can create. Right, so, you know, there's no, the dynamics will only, things that only dynamics can do. Because the worst guy to play in a band with is the guy who is just, you know. You, we all know that guy, and we've all been that guy. So, um, like I said, the one thing to practice is to try to play as softly as you possibly can, and then as loud as you can. Because you know, the dynamic range of the guitar, let's say it's here, so you want to maybe start off in the middle. I got room on either side. So how do I handle my dynamics? It's a good question. There's a bunch of ways. First thing, um, I can, you know, roll back my volume, which I'm going to do a lot. Because I might, I like playing with a little bit more. There might be a little more gain that I would have on my guitar sound the way it is. But I would just leave it like this, right, somewhere like this. So if I roll back my volume, the guitar cleans up, but my volume doesn't necessarily go down too much. Someone like Robin, which I was surprised to uh, to find. Okay, you watch someone like another one of my heroes is Mike Landau, and Mike Landau is always touching the volume knob on the guitar, right? He's always adjusting it. And I was watching you. Know, sorry, this thing is driving me nuts today. Watching Robin playing with him, and he never touches the volume knob at all, ever. Like zero, never touched it. And I'm like, what? So everything is coming from his hands. Um, Everything is coming from his hands. So when you're playing this way, you really want to practice getting, right, getting this, how much volume you can get out of your hands. And that, that is one of my things um, that I want to say about playing loud really really great dynamics and matt schofield and i've talked about this he talked about it when we did the lockdown together and and he plays loud well his amp is set really loud um robin's amp is really loud and as a result of playing with them i started 
playing louder than I would normally at New in New York or sometimes. But I like playing fairly loud, not because I can play loud and I'm, I'm drowning at everybody. It's because it allows you to play much more dynamically. So Matt was saying, and I've had this with friends who play my amp, they start, if they sit in and they start playing, it's really like, man, this is really loud. I'm like, well, the way you're playing it, yeah, because I don't play, I'm working the, the dynamics of the amp a bit more. Um, so yeah, that's an important thing. So sometimes volume, that is one of the real benefits of volume, that it does provide you a much larger dynamic range. Okay, so... That's your excuse for playing loud. Everybody, just turn up because you can play more dynamically. But it's totally true. It is totally true. And I try to, you know, fake it as much as I can here. So, you know, but when you're on a real gig volume, it's, it adds a whole other level. And um, so loud is good if you know how to handle it. Okay. So, once again, so I'm going to soft and loud. So if I'm gonna, sometimes I'm going to use my volume knob, which is a big part of it. But mainly it's dynamics of my hand, how hard and how soft I hit. Right? Okay, so, um, okay, I just saw uh, uh, S.C. Nesbitt. Loudness can be how firmly you hold the pick. Excellent point. Thank you. Yeah. So it all comes down to um, how you're holding the pick, too, right? So I hold the pick firmly enough that it doesn't fall out of my hands and loose enough that it will actually kind of pivot back and forth. Um, also, um, I can go... I can pick closer to the bridge. I can change up where I pick and play. But it's important um, to think about... Right? Working on it. you got to just work on it all the time. All right. So, i um, got a bunch of questions. It seems like there's some back and forth sync issues. I don't know, guys. I, I test it and it's fine. I think what we're dealing with probably is just some power outages that have happened in the States because we've had a big storm around here. So we're probably dealing with some of that. So either you refresh or you just close your eyes and listen, as, um, as Jason Carter was saying, because there's not much I can do. Once again, Phil is not here today, unfortunately, simply because um, he has no power because uh, the storm went through Long Island where he lives and knocked out a bunch of trees. So, the same at the front of my place. There's a, a nice tree that's in half hanging over. I love it. Nicole, the sitter, like, is it dangerous? I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a tree in half hanging. Yeah, maybe somebody might want to come and take care of that. <laughs> you know? But they haven't gotten here yet. I think they got a lot of things on their, on their hands. All right, so let me go through some of the questions. Thanks, Ramona, for pushing these questions up. Um, as a longtime strat, strat player, this is from The Alchemist. Um, now thinking about getting my first Les Paul tips for selecting a good Les Paul. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. The main thing I look for in a, in a, in a guitar, uh, I, will, I almost never buy one sight unseen, very rare, or that you can't return. Because not all guitars are created equal. I've had the great opportunity to play a bunch of old Les Pauls, like five or six of 58s and 59s in a room and compare them. And I played a few that I were just not great guitars at all. And sometimes it just comes down to the wood. And I've played some, like, Squires that you're like, actually, this is a pretty nice guitar, you know? So there's a lot of variation in just the wood, and sometimes you get a good one. I generally look for a, a fairly light Les Paul. You, here's the thing. You don't want it too light, which is hard to find anyway, um, because too light a Les Paul doesn't really sound like a Les Paul. 
should. And a super heavy one, nobody wants to deal with a super heavy guitar. I mean, you know, do you want 12 pounds or 11 and a half pounds over your shoulder? I don't. So, um, but I look for one that sounds good acoustically. So the first thing you can do is when you strum it, I kind of just, you know, pluck that high E string. And if you feel the vibration coming through the guitar body, right? Which I can here. You feel it here. Yep. You can feel it all through the guitar. If you're high E, if you're feeling it, that's a really good sign. And that means it'll only probably get better with age. Also, strum it. Do you feel the guitar ringing and resonating? I've picked up some vintage guitars that were like, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And you pluck it and it's, you don't feel anything. And you're like, yep, well, this is why this guitar is in perfect condition and it's for sale. Because they just, if it's not feeling it in the guitar, like I was super impressed when I got this, you know, from PRS, they sent this over. Um, oh, just dropped, knocked over my light there. Okay, hold on, let me get my, my fancy light. I love it's all live. You guys should see how this works. There we go. <laughs> um, it's, uh, that guitar, I strummed it and it was, uh, everything is resonating throughout the body. Um, the guitars Michael Tuttle makes. Any guitar I'm going to buy, I definitely look for that first. Strum it, and if you feel it resonating in your body, you're off to a really good start. If it's dead, just put it down and don't touch it. Because you can only expect uh, your guitar to be no better than the day you bought it. Okay? You can always expect your guitar to be no better than the day you bought it. It can get a lot better. And generally speaking, good guitar, one that resonates and sounds cool, will get better. There's, I can guarantee you a, one that does no resonance will, will not really get better. Maybe a hair, but it's not showing the signs. Okay, so, um, so this way, that's the first thing. Also, I look for a good weight. This one is 8, point, eight pounds, 2 ounces, so it's really light. Um, a thing on changing the pickups. Um, these are throwbacks. I upgraded them, so a nice set of pickups will really make a nice difference in the guitar, but at the same time, if the guitar doesn't sound acoustically, if you don't like the guitar with the Gibson pickups in it, then don't buy the guitar, okay? Also, I look for a Les Paul. It's got a nice rounder neck pickup. Not rounder, a little more stratty or telly. Right now. As opposed to you know, that sweet child of mine guitar sound or really thick, woolly neck pickup. I don't like that. I look for one that, um, that does that. Now, another weird thing to look for in a guitar, which is really helpful, is how much it compresses. And this takes a little bit of, of skill and knowing what you want to look for in a guitar, on whether it's a Strat or Telly or Les Paul, is how hard you hit it. If the, if the note almost like kind of flattens out, like, turns into a square wave. Like, it, almost, there's certain guitars that feel like they've got a compressor on them, if that makes sense. So you hit hard, it sounds good. If you hit really hard, it just kind of hits this wall and just sounds kind of snappy and doesn't do it. Um, and it's hard to explain unless you play a guitar long enough and you understand that when you, like my, my old Strat, that's one of the reasons why I got that guitar, I played it, I'm like, it's so dynamic. Like I hit really hard and it doesn't really crap out on me. It can take, kind of everything I can give it. And that's an important thing to look for in a guitar. So, but the main thing, anytime I'm looking for guitar shopping, if I do, I pick up a guitar and do this trick where I, if I don't feel it ringing in the body, especially in the high E string, it, I'm not going to buy it. I just literally put it back on the shelf. Nope. Okay. And sometimes this guitar is hanging on the shell on the, on the rack, pluck that E string. You don't feel anything. I don't even take the guitar off the shelf because I know I'm not going to be interested in it. Okay, that was a long answer, but that's uh, super, I think that's, that was some advice that I learned from working at guitar stores and, and guitar collectors and people I found it to be really true. And um, play it acoustically first. Does it feel good? Does it sound good? Or does it feel like you're playing a plank of wood, you know? Um, weight is, is variable. Like, it depends on what the guitar body is made out of. Like, this from Michael Tuttle is like under seven pounds. It's, it's a little chambered, but it's really super light. And I like light sound, I like light tellies. Um, my Strat is like seven pounds, eight ounces, which is a good, 
I think it's a good weight for an alder strat, you know, uh, ash strats will be lighter. Um, if a guitar, I th I'm a believer, especially if strats are too light, they don't have a lot of low end. Doesn't mean it can't sound good, but it depends on what strat sound you want. So ash bodies with maple necks, like those can be lighter guitars, though my friend Tracy Farmer, who's on here a lot, has got some, he had a 54 that Joe Bonamassa had. If you go on Joe's like Instagram, Joe Barda for a little bit, and um, it was a heavy guitar, man. That was like, you would think this would be featherweight and it's heavy, and he's got some, his old Strat is like six pounds, nine ounces or something. He's got some super light Strats. So the black guards that I've played in my life have always, that I really liked have been the super light ones. I played some heavy black guards, and they're cool, but they're heavy. And, you know, I don't want to have a heavy guitar anymore. It's just too much. So um, this thing is like 8.8 8 pounds, 9 ounces. Um, this is a 52, like an actual. This was Robin's. Um, so you can see you have some videos. Robin playing that. That was his. Um, okay. So uh, there you go. Those are those questions on choosing a Les Paul versus a Strat. It's same with every guitar. If it doesn't resonate when you pick it up and strum it, when it's hanging on the rack, pluck that string, listen to it. Um, and how heavy is it? Because you got to play it. Remember, you got to play it. And if the guitar, and you got to walk around with it. Like I walk around New York City. Well, I did until this ridiculous and started happening. And I had a great sounding gold top. You might see a gold top in some of the True Fire courses. Uh, it was a great sounding guitar, but it's just too heavy. I started, you know, doing some gigs around town. I'm like, oh, the hell with this. This thing was like nine pounds, two ounces, or something like that. Sounded great, but it was just the worst. I just got, I had to get rid of it. Uh, and I know that a friend of mine bought it, who sometimes on here. Like I guess it was a great guitar, and I hate, but I couldn't carry it around. I couldn't do it. You know, because you go to gigs in the subway, and so you got like nine and a half pounds in your back, then the gig bag, and then your, your, your pedal board, which, you know, is usually a lighter one. So if you're talking about, you know, 15 pounds or so on your back, you know, push-ups, right? Thanks, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> no, not even push-ups. You know, the things you, you deal with when you're younger, like, yeah, it's, it's a 12-pound Les Paul, but it's cool. And then you're like, get it, yeah, forget it. All right. Um, all right, some more questions. Sorry, guys, I'm blabbing. I mostly practice the guitar unamped. Is it going to cause any problems? That's from Graham. No, man. Um, you know, I play guitar unamplified all the time. I think what you're going to hear through a good amp is the, ha the sound of your hands. And when you play unamplified is when what you're going to play here is going to come through an amplifier. So as I've gotten older, I play cleaner and cleaner because I just hear the guitar more. And uh, if you're on my, um, if you're on my uh, Instagram page, please join my Instagram page, Jeff, Jeff Mackerlane on Instagram. That would be great. Um, if you go back to Robin's interview that we did uh, together, there's a little quote where he just talks about liking to play directly straight into an amp because just the cleaner got away from distortion. He feels like anything he now puts between his guitar and his amp, and we've got some pedals on the floor that he needs for certain things, but it's almost always right into an amp and then a boost pedal. It's just more stuff that gets in the way of the connection between you and your hands and the strings and the amp. So I kind of feel that way too. So when you play amp unamplified, that's cool. The only thing about playing un unamplified is when you start playing loud, or if you're playing with overdrive or both, you may miss out on a lot of the muting, right? So what you don't hear at, at house volume or unamplified, you gotta probably hear things that, you, that needed to be muted, right? It's like when you hear a jazz guitar player who plays a clean jazz box play with overdrive, they usually sound like crap. Uh, because they're just not used to playing with overdrive. It's a skill. It's like something you have to learn how to play with really well. Just like when you hear jazz guitar players play a jazz box, I mean, rock guitar players, they don't sound very good either because they don't have the touch and the feel. They don't understand how to play that instrument. So if you're playing with gain, you, you really want to, you have to practice it, okay? But I play unamplified all the time to answer that. Do I prefer a Les Paul or a Strat? Um, yes. It's like, it's, it's apples and oranges, man. Depends on what the gig is. I enjoy them both. And I've told this story in, uh, you know, Keith Williams to put it in the five watt world about, you know, sticking to one guitar. I was always a Strat guy, starting off at Jackson's and Charvel's, like a, you know, a shredder guy. And um, 
I just moved to Strats again, and um, if it's a desert island sort of situation, it's going to be a Strat for me. I think I'm a Strat guy. But man, once I realized a good Les Paul doesn't sound like... Um, a good Les Paul sounds like the old cliche is a huge Telecaster. And so when you get one and you start to understand that a Les Paul doesn't have to be this big, woolly rock thing, which can sound cool, and they send nothing beats a Les Paul for like a Marshall. But um, once you start to figure out that uh, they all have their, their things, so it, it's tough. I, when I'm playing a Les Paul, they're my favorite. When I'm playing a Strat, it's my favorite. But a Desert Island situation would be a Stratocaster. I find them to be more... Um, well, more comfortable to sit with, <laughs> sit down and play. Um, practically, they're much more, much less delicate. So when I'm traveling, you know, traveling with Les Paul, you're always like, eh. you know, I got a Calton, a Calton case for this, and it's heavy. Strat, just throw it in the gig bag, and I feel really confident about it. Um, I just feel like Strats, I can be, I sound a little bit more like me on a Strat. And um, the story that I've told before that when I was playing with Robin, he kind of got on me about playing Strats because I sounded like I was playing a Strat too much. Um, you know, I was doing a lot of Strat cliches, sounded very Hendrixy at time or Steve Ray. And he had a really good point, you know, because that's kind of what I grew up on. So for about, I don't know, a year, I didn't really play the Strat. I was just playing Les Pauls because he thinks he prefers the way I play on a Les Paul. And I knew what he was saying. So then after I felt like, all right, I want to go back to the Strat a little bit, I felt like I played Strats differently which is really cool. I didn't use the bar as much. I didn't rely on a lot of the same cliches that I used to. So I'm, I'm kind of back to playing strats a lot, and I don't feel like um, I do a lot of the same things I used to because I had to work out a bunch of things in this, which I, I love playing. Love playing Les Pauls. And I love this PRS, man. It's kind of like in between the two, so uh, who, who knew how much I'd like that guitar? I mean, I really like that guitar. It's great. And you know what's cool? People say, well, how does the, the PRS compare to the Les Paul compared to the strat? What... As I said to the guys at PRS, which are um, totally uh, totally cool people, I said, wow, it's the guitar I didn't realize I needed. And it's the Grissom model, and you guys know I'm good friends with David. And he's like, yeah, man, like that's why we designed it, because it sounds old school, but has a different tone than this, but it still falls into that. And um, I can shred on that better than I can shred on this. P90s, yeah, man, I love P90s. Yeah, P90 is great. All right, two words, Matt Schofield. What about Matt, Tom? Matt's a great guitar player. Strat guy. Though he loves 335s too. Um, okay, some more questions. Um, oh, Tom Bukovac and Tim Pierce recently commented on turning up the amp volume and then playing really softly. It must be a thing. It, it is a thing, for sure. Yeah, and that's one of the problems, um, something I didn't realize. Coming, okay, coming from a heavy metal background, it was like louder, louder. Um, and I had a clean channel on my amp, like those channel switching amps that like a Marshall Jam P1. And then when I wanted to um, change um, tones, I would step on a pedal and I would never touch my volume knob except to turn off my guitar, which is the wrong way to do it, you know? So everything now, I don't care about channel switching. Yet. This, okay, my, my Turex got a channel switching. It just has a, a gain channel, but I set them kind of equal in volume. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, I don't really play through channel switchers in the traditional sense for that reason. Um, all right. Let's see what else we have. Um, any other questions, guys? Okay. Oh, which throwback pickups do you have in your Les Paul? Um, this, these are the, uh, um, SL, what is it, SL? Oh, I can't remember, suddenly, 101s. The, 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 no, the 101s. Yeah, the, um, yeah, the 101s. Um, SLE 101s, that's it. And there's the Peter Green ones. I have those. Uh, in the closet. I had them in a guitar and I took them out of a different guitar that I owned. And I really like the Peter Greens, but this is uh, the SLE 101. And uh, what I have this is the reverse magnet on the neck so I can get that Peter Green that out of phase thing. So 
So I have that in this guitar, which I really like. Uh, I highly recommend uh, throwbacks. They're, they're expensive, but they're great. I, I mean, gone through a lot of pickups, and I find these consistently would be great. I also have the throwbacks in my, the 64 throwbacks in my Tuttle strap, which sound really great, too. So, all right. Um, what's the best spice to use, uh, to use very well to turn around or go crazy and flash solos in the next, or both? Um, okay, let me, I'm trying to get that one. So, um, yes, sit-ups for back strength. Yes, I'll start doing them so I can carry around a 12-pound Les Paul. What's the best spice? To use it very well to turn around or, you know, um, or bo both, man. This is for... Uh, Tarsicio, it both, you know, it, everything depends on context, right? So sometimes ripping a really cool, crazy turnaround will sound awesome. And being able to play a really simple one, it's all context of the music that you're playing in. So if you want to play a soft blues and you're getting into it, a crazy turnaround is going to sound kind of stupid. And the one thing I, I have to say as a, to the very beginning, if you guys watch back to the intro, the, uh, the whole thing was this course is about, now we're just talking, now we're just answering questions and talking guitars and shop, which I love doing. But it's, it's really important um, to uh, work on those variations that I played in the beginning. Just your basic boogie-woogie once again. Like and really get solid with those. Like I said, there was a large degree of hubris for me and a lot of bands that I played when I was younger that I, you know, I can throw in all this cool stuff I've been working on. Here's a Schofield lick, a John Schofield lick. Um, make this fit, or Robin Ford, I'm gonna play some diminished, and the band's playing like an old school shuffle. And I sound like an idiot, because I just didn't have enough vocabulary uh, to make it through those tunes. So I, I would highly recommend checking out all those chess records, uh, Little Walter, and just learning some of those tunes, just going through, and that's where I got all these ideas, you know. Um, okay. Bit off topic. Uh, effects. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me go through this. Okay. Thoughts on Mike Bloomfield. Um, you know, he's, he's great. You know, uh, he didn't, he's got moments for me where I think it's really amazing. And of course he's great. And Robin and I have hung out many nights playing each other music that we loved and grew up with. And he'd play me this Mike Bloomfield stuff, and I'm like, eh, that's great. But it didn't get me like some of the other guys. And then I would play him, you know, some Billy Gibbon stuff from the early records. And he's like, yeah, it's cool. So it, it falls into that, I think you had to be there moment. You know what I mean? So he was there while Mike Bloomfield was doing all that. So he was young, and he saw it, and, it was, and it's great. Um, but I think part of it is when you were there at the time. Like... You know what I'm saying? Like, you were, you were there at that moment, and he saw them play. And with, you know, when I was younger, hearing, like, you know, Cheap Sunglasses or something, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And that really hit me really strong. So I think that's it. Um, but, you know, Bl Mike Bloomfield's great, for sure. But he's, he's not an influence on me. I think some of the people I like are, inf are influenced by him. But from that era, it's, it's, if you're talking blues guys, it's Clapton and Peter Green for me. Um, Okay, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. updates on my True Fire channel. Coming up, it's coming up, I know. I've been really busy, which is great. I'm very happy about that, yes. Um, yep, I'm going to start doing the subscription club. Yeah, that's still in the works, right? Yes, um, that is going to be my True Fire channel. So you'd get extra information there, and it would just be like a monthly thing. So you'd get extra videos and tab and notation and, and things like this, but just just more of it. Okay. Um, yes, I did come from a heavy metal background. A lot of other stuff background. But heavy metal meaning like 80s metal more so than what you'd call today's metal. Okay. Um, you know, my color, you ditched the pick about 10 years ago. You know, I play without a pick all the time. But what it, it stops me from being able to do is, you know, like... I want to play the metal stuff, or even rock. Like, you can't get a lot of those things, and two of my favorite guitar players don't play with a pick. Three. Jeff Beck doesn't play with a pick. 
uh, Mark Knopfler doesn't play with a pick and Wes Montgomery doesn't play with a pick. But when you don't play with a pick, you have to design the way you play guitar specifically to what you're doing. And those guys all lead their, or led, in Wes's case, their own bands. So for me, I need that kind of thing that a pick will give me. Um, but man, playing without a pick enables you to do many, many cool things. Like I say, listen to Jeff Beck and Mark Knopfler. That's integral to their sound and their style. But as a professional, it, it would be very difficult for me to just to, to drop playing with a pick. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you so much. And thank you to Ermano for filling in for Phil. Phil says hello to everybody. He's sorry he's not here. And uh, thanks for hanging out. And I will see you. Don't forget, I'm not doing the live interviews until um, uh, the weekends, um, until again in September. So right now, uh, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., as always, for the lesson, please, uh, if you want to uh, hit the tip jar, I really appreciate that. All you guys have been doing that uh, a lot, and I really appreciate that. And my True Fire course is 25% off through my website only. And uh, please share this stuff. Join my, please sign up for my True Fire, sorry, my YouTube channel. That's this, my YouTube channel. Please sign up here, you guys. And my um, Instagram. That's it. Please sign up on my Instagram. I'm trying to get that rolling too. Lots to do. So thanks, everyone. I will see you same time next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>